Thank you. Hello, and a warm thank you to the Peabody family, to the community of Baltimore, and a hearty congratulations to the Peabody class of 2016. To have been asked to give this address is a great honor. I'm grateful for having been recognized here on a number of occasions since my graduation. As Dean Bronstein mentioned, I've been uh, back in the Peabody community as a member of this diversity task force, and I'm very impressed with the honesty, commitment, and quality of, this, quality of the discussions ongoing in that committee that will position Peabody to be a leader in this very important area. This is my second commencement address, and as such, a couple of things about my first happen to be relevant. There's an expression about composers, good composers borrow, great composers steal. I promise you I will be stealing a bit from that address. At that time, my first thoughts drifted to two inspiring commencement addresses that I had read as a student. One by the pianist Glenn Gould, the other by the composer, conductor, and educator Leonard Bernstein. I was doing a lot of reading and thinking about what to talk about when my thoughts drifted to something one of my good friends who was a writer had once said. The first novel you write, you write what you know. What you know is yourself. I thought, well, let's see how well I know myself. While I was working on it, I was asked for a title, even a working title. I thought, well, that's it, working title. It was part just, but then I realized there's some truth to that. What your graduates are about to be presented with is a working title. My certificates are in piano, violin, and conducting. Those certificates and diplomas have provided for me a working title. I'm a concert pianist, a professor, and a conductor. I have been, or I am, or have been as well, a fundraiser, a festival organizer, a mentor. I've been the artistic director and creator of three festivals, a collaborator, and an adjudicator. Each of those things, though related to a degree in music, requires a different skill set. My thoughts also drifted to the business world. I thought of one of my good friends who has a master's degree in chemical engineering. He's a head of research and development at Estee Lauder. His career has been peripherally related to chemistry, but his professionally developed skill set has nothing to do with his degrees. He is now and has been for the bulk of his career a businessman, a manager of people and projects, and an innovator. I would like for each one of you once you leave here, to look at your degree for a minute, reflect on your accomplishment, make sure your name is spelled correctly, <laughs> and file that working title away. You're on the precipice of a distinctly different world than the one at which I appeared some 25 years ago when I left here. The music world is now in many ways a more open place than when I graduated. It is interesting that feats of computer engineering made it possible for there to be more possibilities in careers in music. Who would have thought that something called YouTube could be a springboard to a career in classical music? I would like for you to think about being an innovator to begin your career. Glenn Gould wrote that the artist can be measured by the degree of difficulty of the questions they ask of themselves, by the nature of the challenges they ask of themselves. This posing and resolving of challenges will require of you your fullest capacities of imagination, inspiration, and innovation. I will provide you with a couple of examples of important challenges that I have provided as a teacher and that I faced as a student. Now I challenge you to find a moment to be brave enough to cast aside the concerns of your parents, your teachers, the impending doom of student loan payments, and ask yourself, who am I? What do I love to do, to read about, to hear about, to think about? Do I love music in all its totality? Am I an ambassador for music? Or am I just really good at playing the viola and no one else is? I absolutely believe that every one of us has that thing in life we cannot do without, that thing with which we have to be engaged in every day. For me, that thing was and remains music. I ask you to know that thing that you love the most. I sincerely hope that your answer is music, but you should also be prepared if it is not. Somehow many people manage in their lives daily without being able to do that thing or combination of things that they love. They put it away in their overstuffed drawer of dreams, which may seem like a safe place. But I believe it was Nelson Mandela who said that you must honor that which is within you, the gifts you have, and release them. Otherwise, it will be those things which remain inside of you and will kill you. I had an undergraduate student who for every year, every lesson was prepared to the absolute word of what I asked for every week. Completely well prepared, 
but never a bar more, never a bar less. Faultless, sort of. It came for decisions about her future, and she spoke of master's degree programs. And I said, do you love playing the piano? After a look of terror ran across her face and left and came back, she said, uh, no. I said, I know. What's the point of going on on this treadmill? After extensive conversations and a round of auditions, she took a year off and eventually realized that what she wanted to do was to help heal people and is now in a very good music therapy program. Without that challenge of taking the time to find out what she loved, she would be frankly still on that treadmill right now. You must imagine either what you know is out there as a career and yourself doing it, or imagine that thing which you love, which doesn't currently have a place in your life, and find the way to its possibility. Glenn Gould talked about the difference of what we know and has been proven to work, which he called positivity, and that which we do not know, or hasn't been proven or tried, which he called negativity. We construct a small frame in which we live that's defined by things that are known. He suggests that artists in particular must in our minds constantly dip into the great unknowns and unprovens as a resource for reaching our dreams. In your every job or circumstance, be alert to the opportunities that lend themselves to your other strengths, whether that means you're good at working with people or developing, transforming, or executing ideas. In our current music industry, this is serious capital. We need people with great inspiration to imagine the transformation of the image and the way of life of what we do and love. If you are open to this, you will discover that you have other talents. Talent, as you will find out, is simply working hard at doing something you love, and surprise, you get good at it. After you've identified your must-do, let no one tell you what is not possible. Among the things an innovator does is to challenge the orthodoxy. I was constantly asked from the age of 16 to 23 by those who are my mentors, when are you going to stop with this two-instrument nonsense? What do you want to be when you grow up? In my mind, I felt that getting two private lessons a week about how music works was an incredible, priceless thing. Well, it did come at a price. Peabody charged me one and a half times tuition. <laughs> Nonetheless, I felt that this was my great capital investment. I had a ton of knowledge and understanding about how music works. I was open to finding my own path as a musician. I did not know what all those hours of learning would mean in my life, but I knew it had to be a good thing. Eventually, I was put to the test by my piano teacher, Robert Weirich, who issued a powerful challenge to me. A few days after what I thought had been my successful senior recital, just a few days before my 23rd birthday, he sent me a three-page, single-spaced letter. He said to me that what he and others such as Gary Grafman recognized as my talent was, and I quote, an uncanny knack for projecting the piece as an integrated experience to the listener. The audience is aware of the whole at every moment, and so one sense of time and experience is altered by the music. I know of no higher satisfaction of either listener or performer. When that happens, you remember it your whole life. You can count on the fingers of one hand those who are able to do what you can do. I'm reading the letter, I'm like, Awesome. <laughs> and then he says in the same paragraph, you have musical ideas that are more eccentric than innovative. You have a technique that gets in the way rather than facilitates. I'm falling, <laughs> stooping as I'm reading. He continued to drive home the point by saying that if somebody hears you when you're under the age of 21, they say, what potential? Over the age of 21, what a waste. That's, gee, that's too bad. He's so talented and he still can't play the piano. And then he said, I think you can fix this problem, but only if you think that it's important. Keep in mind that, as you know, the music business loves prodigies. So in many ways, read both 30 years ago and today, I was already over the hill at the age of 23. What to do now? After feeling like I'd been punched in the gut, I took the letter to heart. My investment until that point had been directed towards music in general. I now refined it to the piano and I then spent a great amount of intensity and time thinking about my technique. A couple of years later, when I was 25, I went on retreat to the BAMP Center in Canada for a three-month, very intensive period of independent study without a teacher, trying to consolidate, as I'd worked out, the 420 hours of lessons that I'd had in music school 
into my own ideas about how music is organized and how to play with technical security. 13 months after leaving Banff and returning to the conservatory, I won Nauberg and started my career. I was incredibly lucky to have a teacher that believed in me and challenged me to deliver to my potential, even though by the time of fruition, I was not his student anymore. We must keep in mind that as teachers, we ask for the now of a necessity, but our every sentence plants seeds. I hope ultimately that I'm planting a small one today for you as well. Think of your personal relationship with music, your skill set. Know that you must develop yourself as a whole person, that you must find and be true to what's inside of you, to what inspires you, and to what you imagine. Then be completely invested and intense in the pursuit of the realization of your dreams. As to challenges, one of the most important qualities required in the face of challenge or to issue a challenge is courage. But as musicians, we all have this courage. It is reflected daily when we take a breath, when we draw the bow, when we raise our hands to the piano to say, this is how this phrase goes. William Reitz wrote powerful words which are so unfortunately often true in his poem, The Second Coming. He wrote that the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. While I understand what Yeats meant, in my life I try to turn these damning words around. I ask you, the Peabody class of 2016, to be your absolute best, however it is that you define it, to have all the conviction in your ideas, and to execute full of passionate intensity. And please, what I've left out here, but it's really important, in your passionate intensity, include loving and appreciating your family and friends, the ones who got you here today. Stay in touch with your teachers, especially the ones who have most productively challenged you. Be a great colleague to your peers, as our world is at once large and very small. And nurture a consistent reaching out to those who do not have the opportunities that you have had. Good luck and congratulations again.